But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh unto them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded support the weak be patient toward all men now this path's two cents i know that can be real hard sometimes we get tired sometimes we get tired of ourselves so we have to really pray and ask god to help us when it comes to helping to being there for other people and being patient with other people. All right. Now, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, but among your, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, Despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. That means not only abstain from all evil, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole heart, spirit, and soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Now, some of the things that we find issue with issues with in our lives, we know we're in the last days. We know that Jesus is coming very, very soon. And we know we must be ready. But sometimes we lose sight of being ready. And one of the things that tends to dummy us down and lull us into our endless sleep. So what's the score? I bet you they lose. I bet you they win. I bet you they lose. No, they don't win. A mental sleep an emotional sleep, a spiritual sleep. We slumber and sleep. <coughs> and slumber and chill. What you doing? I'm chilling. What you doing? I'm chilling. And you get so caught up in now, there's nothing wrong in watching movies, so, you know, don't take that to the extreme. 
but there's a balance. And anytime the movies takes up all the time that you could have spent with God, that is an imbalance. Yes, it's okay to be entertained here and there. But when your focus is on God, you will find that you need less and less entertainment. The more entertainment you indulge in, this is just a natural. It's a natural run of events. It's like saying, if I, th <clears throat> if I throw something up in the air, the natural gravity will automatically make it come back down. Right. So it's the same thing. It's a natural run of events. When you feed one thing, the other one dies. So it depends on which one are you feeding the most. What are you feeding the most in your life? Okay. God has called everyone in our group into leadership. But if you're spending your developmental times for leadership, if you are using the time that you could be learning at Jesus' feet, that you could be using him as your example as a leader, watching what he says, watching what he does. You can't do that without getting in the word. You can talk about him till the cows come home, but you got to read what he did. You have to read the eyewitness accounts of how he led, of how his character prevailed over nasty attitudes. You have to watch what he did, what he said, how he did it, how he said it, when he did it, when he was silent, when he spoke, and why. You have to get a feel of what made him tick in order to get a picture of what God would like to see in you. When you live this life, a person who knows nothing about God should be able to look at you and say, there's something different about you. You ain't like the norm. There's something really special. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something special about you. Now, when you spend, you were talking earlier about input output, and that's why I was so hot on it because it's part of the message. When you spend your time listening to jazz, listening to your favorite music, whether it's classical, whatever it is, rock and roll, hard rock, punk rock, metal, whatever. Love music, let's get it on. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. See, there's a difference between worldly music and secular music. Let's, let's go there for a minute. A lot of times we don't understand it if it hasn't been taught. But there is inspirational, there is worldly, and there is secular. Let's dissect that for a minute. The meaning of worldly is anything that lends and trends and leads you away from the ways of God. Secular, nice little songs. Like, um, let me give you a quick example of a nice little song. I'm just a teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. Okay, it's just a little silly song. Or you get a little song by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, or, you know, like, you know, where have all the young men gone? Or you hear another song by, by, um, uh, can't think of his name. Anyway, and he's talking about what's going on. War is not, is not the, answer, the answer, for only love, love can complicate. Talking about the crap that's going on in the world. Well, it's highlighting the things that are wrong in life. He's not saying anything wrong. He's not si singing anything sinful. He's making an observation that something's not right with this picture. Well, that's a secular song. But when you deal, I'm trying to do this so you can get a picture of it. When you deal with worldly, worldly would be like, 
If loving you is wrong, I don't want to do right. That's worldly because that is putting a positive spin on sin. You get me? All right. So anything, whether it's music or anything that puts a positive spin on sin, that's worldly. That's the quickest way I can put it. Or you get songs where they're rapping about bees and holes and 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 shooting and banging and all the little stuff that they sing about. That's worldly. There's nothing positive about it. There's it it all glorifies the ugliness of sin, the stench of sin. It tries to paint a pretty picture. Yeah. So that's worldly. But when you, and, and I'm going to share this with you. One day I was listening to a classical song. It was really beautiful because I like classical music. And uh, it was really nice. But then I started feeling depressed. I started feeling down. I started feeling gloomy. I started feeling hopeless. And I'm wondering what the heck is going on? Well, where did that come from? And then I, it hit me. The song doesn't have words, but who knows the spirit of the person that put that together. So why don't we turn that off and see what happens? As soon as I turned it off and switched to another song, wasn't even Christian, just another song, that feeling left just like that. And I said, whoa, so we could be listening to stuff watching stuff and not even know that it was dedicated to get this type of a response and is filled with a negative spirit and it's anointed by the devil and we're wondering why our atmosphere is just soured just like that even if it doesn't have words your spirit can pick up on something that is worldly i'm telling you so that's why we have to be careful what we put in some of the games, some of the songs, some of the movies, some of the clothing, some of the jewelry have demonic attachments more now than before. And you wonder why the atmosphere is so tainted why our mood swing from happy-go-lucky to I want to die. You wonder where that comes from. What are you filling your atmosphere with? You're to be used by God. You can't allow yourself to just dabble with anything. You could be trying to live as holy as you, as you can. But you allowed something in that wasn't godly. Or you allowed something in that had a demonic attachment. And you wonder why your attitude is so foul. How did that argument just, just jump off of nowhere? Where did that argument come from? I remember Lynn told me about a time when she and her husband... We're just talking and all of a sudden, bam, attitude. Whoop! Where'd that come from? Out of the blue. See, demons are sitting there with bated breath, <laughs> just waiting to pounce on every crack in the door, waiting to jump in any opening they can because they want to spoil your feast of charity. They want to disturb your peace. Anything to get you off of God's beaten path. And if you are allowing them, not realizing it, that's why we have to guard our minds, guard our hearts. Everything, how can I say this so that you get it? Not everything is a sin. And not everything that's not a sin is allowable. So we have to ask God when we start to feel something different in the air, Lord, what's going on? 
You know, where'd that come from? Did I just crack a door open unknowingly? Like I had done that day when I was just listening to a classical station. And the music was beautiful. But when it got to that song, the atmosphere went dark instantly. And I realized it was the song, that particular song. And once I stopped the song, that atmosphere lifted. So we have to constantly be awake. See, if you're sleeping, you don't know what's going on around you. And that's why the word is admonishing you to be awake, to be sober, not sleep. To be aware, constantly on the watch. You've constantly... Do you know why the 300 spies, I mean, the 300 men were picked when God called Gideon to call other people to join him, his army? And God wanted a small number, like a, a small number, so that his glory would be revealed in the small number. He said, if y'all got thousands, you're going to think you won the victory on your own. So what he did was he sent them down to test the soldiers. And when they went down to the brook, he said, now, tell them to drink the water. And they're drinking the water. Those that were given, listen to this, listen to this. Every one of you is called to be a leader. You got to be aware of this stuff. They were the ones that were given to their appetites given to their flesh, given to their desires, given, I mean, all caught up in me, myself, and I. What about me? When they went in, they bowed down and dunked their face in that water and they were just slurping it up. Were they looking around them? No. Where was their focus? On the water. Anybody could have walked up on them and stabbed them in the back. They wouldn't have even noticed their shadow. Why? They were thirsty and they wanted to meet their own need, period. But you get somebody, the 300, what did they do? They put their hand in the water, scooped it up to their faces, and they lapped like dogs. Why? Their eyes were up. They were able to see their physical position was in a position of readiness for anything that could have come on them. They were not given and all caught up in their appetites with their faces just slapping the water up into their faith. No, their eye, their head was up. Their hands came to their mouth. They didn't drop their head into the water their hand brought the water to their mouth. When you're in that position, you're looking around, you're ready, you're watching, you're listening, you're aware. Things can't come up on you by surprise, like the ones that are given to their appetites. So I ask you, when you look at your daily routine and you look at how you interact with your families and you look at what you do with your spare time, is your time dedicated to your appetites? Is your time dedicated to your flesh? Are you asleep? Are you walking in a stupor? Are you drunken by the entertainment that you listen to? Think about how you spend your time in these last days. Watching a movie is not a sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you have eight hours of free time and seven and a half of those hours is taken up with the worldly entertainment, God's not getting much of your time. I've been guilty of it too. I'm not, I'm not fussing. I'm trying to make us aware of how much more time we need to spend with God. You know, us, our lady and I, we used to sit in the car after church service and we would sit there waiting on the Lord. She wasn't saying anything. I wasn't saying anything. 
You know how many people are uncomfortable with silence? And that's why they fill their time up with entertainment because they're uncomfortable with themselves. They're uncomfortable with silence. They're too impatient to wait on the Lord. And she and I would sit in that car sometimes 30 minutes, not saying a word, waiting on the Lord. And guess what? Something would start to happen. Now, what I'm saying is to say to you, you can't put a clock on God's time. You want to experience God. You want to put your ear to his bosom. You want to hear his heartbeat about this day and age and what he wants out of your life. You got to get in some silent time. You don't have to be running your mouth, you know, to be in God's presence. You can praise and worship for a while because he inhabits the praises of his people. But then there comes a point where you need to shut your mouth and open your ears, open your spirit, and wait on the Lord. And if you're starting to get groggy while you're waiting, stand up and walk around the room, but wait. Say, Lord, talk to me. Lord, minister to me. Show me what you want me to do. Give me revelation. Tell me what you want me to read. Prophesy to me. I have stood and heard prophecy going in my spirit. Ain't nobody in the room talking. It's me and God. I'm telling you, there are so many experiences we miss out on. Because we're so busy being busy. We're playing. We're napping. We're sleeping. We're shopping. We're, we're jamming on the music. We're yakking on the phone about everything else but the Lord. We're fussing. We're arguing. We're fuming. And I ain't going to mention all the other stuff we can get caught up in doing. But my point is, when we want God in our lives, we've got to reach up, not just reach out. Because you reach out, you got the TV. You reach out, you got your radio. You reach out, you got your, your CDs. You reach out, you got your games. You reach out, you got the phone. There's a whole lot of stuff you can be putting your hands to. But my question is, how bad do you really want it? So you can tell me you love me till the cows come home. You can tell me you want to marry me and spend the rest of your life with me till the cows come home. You can even take it to the altar and say, I do a hundred times to convince me that you really want to be my husband. But guess what? If you out there screwing around the next week, then what was it all for? If you're spending all your nights out at the nightclub and you hardly ever coming home, what you get married for? Think about, think about what I'm talking about. What would happen if Lynn and her husband only got together two hours, two hours, <laughs> two hours a week and the rest of the time Lynn was hanging out at her mama's house? Uh, how long you think that would last? Yeah. See, a lot of us want, we really want God, but we're dating him. We're not married to him. We're on a date. And it's like, don't call me, I'll call you. And when I get good and bored and I'm ready for you to come do something in my life, or I need you, I'll call on you. Now, if you come, cool. If you don't, that's all right. I got my other plans. I, I just do my thing. But here's the trip. You ain't calling on them to be with them. You're calling on them because you, know, you want something. Yeah. He's like your little sugar daddy, your vending machine. You put your coin in the slot, that's your little five-second prayer. 
and then you expect him to jump and produce. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful how we treat him. There should be times where all we want to do is thank him. Thank him for all he's done. Thank him for all the stuff he did not allow to go wrong in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes I just walk through my house and I just thank God. I, drive, I, I look at the video of my car and I just thank God. I'm just grateful. I look at pictures of my husband. I thank God. Oh, I mean, the blessings God has bestowed me with. I listen to my voicemail. I keep a, 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 a tape of, the, of when I was at the hospital calling my voicemail to remind myself when I got home from ICU to take care of this bill, that bill, and the other bill. And I could barely talk because I could barely breathe. To, to, I would t have to breathe in between every few words because I was so winded. And I listened to that to remind myself, look how far God has brought me. Look at his healing. Thank you, Lord. Now, my question to you is, how much are you willing to bring to this relationship? You know, in the streets when they used to uh, shoot pool and you know, I'm talking about the guys that gamble. I wasn't a gambler. I just like shooting pool. But the guys that gamble, they used to talk this trash about, uh, come on, man, you know, you got to bring something to get something now. You know, you got to bring it. Bring it on. Bring it on. Well, that's kind of what God's saying, in essence. What are you willing to bring in order to get? It ain't about you scratch my back, I scratch your back. But if God was speaking, he would be saying something like, I want to know how much you want me. Not what's in my pocket. Not what's in my hand. How much do you want me? Because see, when you want me, you also want your destiny. You want to know what you can be doing to enhance the kingdom. You want to develop as a leader in such a way that there are certain things you will not tolerate in your life. Why? Because of me. Because I mean that much to you. Because my ways are precious to you. Not because I got something I'm going to give you. I'm going to bless you if you're, if you're good. You know, you get your allowance if you're a good kid all week. No. I want to know that you are doing all you can to be all you can be for me. And if you don't love me, that's okay. Tell me. Confess that. And just like Aretha said, and I've done when I was first saved, ask God to help you love him. Ask God to motivate you out of love. Let everything you do, everything you say, everything you refrain from, oh my goodness, everything you reach for and you hunger for, be out of a desire for God. Because when you love God and you know God loves you, and you got to press in to get to that point. You really got to press in, y'all. You want to be a leader. You want to be used by God. You want to go around having words for everybody. You want to be able to touch their lives. But first of all, you and God got to touch each other. What you going to touch them with if you ain't got God to that point? You so antsy, so busy wanting to get out and put that key in the ignition and drive the car, but you never studied the manual to learn how to drive. You haven't taken the test to qualify, to get behind the wheel. I'm talking analogies now. You know what I'm talking about. So a lot of you, you you're gifted. You're highly gifted. Every one of you, you have so much to offer. 
But what are you doing to invest in that gift? What are you investing in the relationship between you and God? What is the first commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength. I'm just ad living here. I'm I'm uh, paraphrasing. Give God your all and press in until you get that love. And once you're motivated out of your love for God, everything else starts to line up, including you. Then you start dealing with you. And you start getting your house in order. You start lining up. When Milton and I first got married, I started listening to him more carefully and I listened to what he said and I listened to what he didn't say. And I noticed it started giving me more understanding of him. I've never been blind. Here I'm married to a blind man. So I had to find a way to relate to what he was going through in order to be able to you know, when you're married to a person for a long time and you really, really invested in the relationship, you tend to be able to predict what they're going to want on a particular day, what they'd like to do with their pastime, what would put a smile on their face. You know what kind of treats you can get them because you know them. But there are people who are in marriages who don't know their spouse no more than they know the, the bottom of their shoe. They don't know their spouse worth a doo-doo. Why? Because they're so caught up in themselves. They're too busy pleasing me, myself, and I. They're self-centered. They're self-conscious. They're all about self. They're narcissistic, me, myself, and I. My way or the highway. And they really don't count. That's a horrible marriage to be stuck with somebody that's like that with you. A lot of people are like that with God. And that's what short circuits the blessings, the callings, the appointments, the assignments, the ministry. How can you minister if you have nothing to offer? How can you offer anything if you haven't invested? If you haven't received anything to offer, if I want to give Rashad a hundred dollars, I can't give him a hundred dollars if I don't have a hundred dollars. How can you give love, the love of God to a person when you don't have the love of God? How can you be an example of holiness if you're not living holy, if you're living in sin? You get that word in you. You pray, you ask God questions, get a pen and pad in hand and start writing. God can lay all kinds of things on your mind. He can speak to your heart and you can write it down and have it to reflect on later. God can begin to teach you and warn you and walk you through. He can give you understanding. He can correct you. He can clean you up and show you where your leaning side is and what needs to be strengthened, what part of you needs to be strengthened. And while he's doing that, it increases and improves your relationships with other people so that you're not rendering evil for evil, but you're following that which is good among yourselves. And when the Holy Spirit gives you a prompting, you don't ignore it. Let me give you an example of a prompting. The night before last, I had a dream that a friend of mine was looking at me sadly. I was getting ready to go into a building and she was looking at me sadly as if she really was longing for me to stay. And she said, I don't know if I'll be here when you come back. I don't know how much longer I have to live. And I told her, I said, I'll call you right back. And I left and went to the building. 
When I woke up, the first thing on my mind was call my friend, call my friend, call her, because she's not in a good place right now. And when I called, turned out she was feeling sad and she was contemplating, wondering how much longer she had. You see, you got to have the prompting of the spirit to make you aware of even what other people's needs are. You can't just assume because you think you all that in a bag of chips. No, you may think one thing is going on and God may show you something totally different. Ask God to communicate to you through your dreams, communicate to you through the word of God, communicate to you on a daily basis in your thought life, communicate. But if you're busy with all kind of noise, you know, what happens when, you know, we have our little meetings and somebody's got a lot of background noise going on? It drowns out the person's voice who's speaking a lot of times, doesn't it? That's the way our lives are. We drown God out so many times. And entertainment is one of the biggest ways we do so with. Okay, anyway. This is more of an admonition than anything else. For those of you who know you have a calling on your life, and I know everybody in our group does, but for those of you even on YouTube, pull the reins in. Focus. Get a pinpointed focus going on. Put your energies to your calling, not to your pastime. This is for all of us here, including me. We all need to be reminded that all that free time we got, it would be nice if God got at least 50% of it, wouldn't it? Uh, that would be a miracle right there. But anyway, at least give him more than just 30 minutes in a day or 30 minutes in a week. Some of you don't give him any time until we get together. And you wonder why you don't know him. Like I said, Lynn's marriage and my marriage would have been down the toilet if we gave our husbands two hours out of a week and we were gone with our girlfriends and our mother, sister, brother hanging out and not spending any time with our husbands. It doesn't work that way. Relationships take investment. Relationship with God requires investment. Meant. All right. God bless you to be all that God wants you to be. But God help you understand the only way that'll happen is by what you put into it, what you bring to the table. God bless you.